If you have a Bible, go ahead and open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 28. And today we are going to conclude a roughly two-year journey through the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, we'll start in verse 16. Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 16. Uh, and this is a, a part of the Bible which is commonly referred to as the Great Commission. The Great Commission. This is the moment where Christ commissions His church to be and to do that which He desires it to be and to do. If I have a big idea for you, it is this. Jesus' final instructions, the Great Commission, are the controlling purpose of the church until his return. The, the things that Jesus says here, they're not like more important than anything else he has said because there's equal value and equal weight to his instruction, to his teaching and all of that. But this is, uh, this really is a summation of the purpose that he has given to us. Why do we get together? Why are we the church? Is it just so that we can have salvation for ourselves? Sing a couple of songs, hear a guy talk about the Bible for a while, and that's it? Is that all that there is to church? Or is there something more? Is there a purpose for us? See, the way that it ought to be understood is that what we do here is only the beginning point of what the church is for in the world. This is launching pad for the church. We come together, we pray, we worship, we hear the word for the purpose of reorienting ourselves to the God who sent his son to save us, to the God who sent his Holy Spirit to dwell inside us for his mission, for his work. And what we're going to talk about today is the, the controlling purpose of the church. So let's go ahead and begin. Your point number one is this, that the Gospel of Matthew sees the earthly ministry of Jesus conclude where it began in a region called the Galilee. So Jesus began his ministry in this place called Galilee, this region of the Holy Land. And this is also where he chooses to bring it to its conclusion. He's not in Jerusalem anymore. He's not at the, the place that was thought to be the center of the operation of the nation of Israel, the capital city, the place where the temple was, the place where the king of Israel reigned, who at this point in history is not even an Israelite. He's a, he's a descendant of the nation of Edom called Herod. He's not a great guy. And there's all sorts of stuff wrong with the temple at this point. And Jesus has enacted a judgment of parable, uh, a parable of judgment against the temple. Uh, when he goes and he's not cleansing the temple, he's showing his judgment and is, he's concluding its ministry. And that finds its fulfillment later in 70 AD. We talked a little bit about that. But he's, he's, he hasn't stayed in Jerusalem. He hasn't stayed in the place where you would expect the operation of the people of God to find its primary seat. He's taken them out and away from that. He's taken them out and away from that to the place where he began the ministry, a little backwater rural area called the Galilee. Called the Galilee. That's where we start today. So Matthew chapter 28 Matthew chapter 28, 16 and 17, verses 16 and 17. Matthew chapter 8, 28, rather, starting in verse 16. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted which is interesting, we'll talk about that in a moment. 
Let's begin here with the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain that Jesus directed them. To the mountain that Jesus directed them. The, this is the final substantive teaching that Jesus gives to the church. Right? This is his parting words. These are the final instructions. These are the last thing he wants the church to know. And sometimes you, you save the, the, the kind of the, the biggest thrusting point for last. And he, and he holds this in reserve until he is at this particular spot. Now, this is how Jesus also began his ministry. Now, we don't know if it's the same spot, but the Sermon on the Mount, right? Is it hap that happens in Galilee. And the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, are essentially the core of the teaching that Jesus gave to his church. And a lot of that stuff would have been repeated in other settings. We actually see that happen in the Gospel of Luke, where he, he repeats some of that same material in different settings. Okay, So this is what G uh, Jesus was. He was like a, an itinerant or a traveling teacher. And what they would do is they would mainly teach the same things over and over in different places. And Jesus would have been doing that. But now what's happened is he's brought them all back at least to the same region, if not the same mountain or the same basic location that he gave the Sermon on the Mountain. This is almost like the long delayed conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount. Or maybe it's the sequel to the Sermon on the Mount. So that, that thing which was his central teaching, he is now bringing a conclusion and saying, and now because of all of that, understand this is what the result is going to be. This is the therefore we're going to do this. Therefore, we are going to focus on this. The long-awaited conclusion, in a sense, to the Sermon on the Mount is what he's about to do. So, the eleven disciples go to Galilee, to the mountain Jesus shows them, and when they saw him, they worshipped. They worshipped. So, they've been with Jesus actually at this point by now for about 40 days. This is about 40 days after the resurrection. It's not like this is the first time they're seeing him and they're like, oh, wow, this is a surprise. Therefore, because I'm, I, I'm having this exuberant feeling, I'm going to worship you. No, they've been with Jesus for more than a month by this point. So this is not a sort of spontaneous, based on a surprising situation response. And we sometimes treat worship like that as if it's sort of based on our feelings. I don't think we're meant to see it that way. And there may be moments where God does something amazing in our lives and it it calls for a worshipful response from him. But this is a response that has long been brewing. It's been brewing for over a month. That the disciples, when they encounter Jesus at this particular spot, at this particular time, after about 40 days of hanging out with Jesus after the resurrection, they say, we must worship this is a, a conscious decision on the part of the people of God. And the beating heart of Christianity is this, that we worship Christ. I, I need to say this, and this is so important. This is very important. Every other instruction that Jesus gives to us, his people, is dependent on on that. If we are not worshiping Christ, we cannot obey the other commandments. We can't obey Christ unless we are obeying him worshipfully. We can't obey out of a sense of, oh, I've got this checklist of things to do. Well, I, I guess Jesus says, tell other people about me, so I'm going to check that off. 
And I guess I, I got to go out and I got to tell somebody about him. That's not obeying the command. That's not obeying the command. That is, in a sense, disobeying the command. Just because you go out and relay information about Jesus, if there's not a change in you, why would you do it in the first place? But, but Christ has done something. Yes? He has changed us. He has brought about our conversion from death to life. What more would call us to worship than that? I'll tell you. The fact that it is the God of all things who is righteous, who is holy, who is perfect, has stepped into history, placed himself beside sinners who are actively and openly in rebellion against him, and said, I will cleanse you. Simply because of who he is, he deserves our worship. He deserves our worship because he is worthy. That's what the word worship means. It means worth-ship. It means his rightness to be attributed worth to. Because he is good, we worship him. Because he is holy, we worship him. Because he is righteous, we worship him. Because he is God, we worship him. And the disciples have all had this. They've been with Jesus for three years by this point. Three years they've watched him. Three years they've failed him at various points. Three years they finally fled from him and abandoned him when he was going to the cross. And then he rises from the dead and calls them to him, forgives them, and now he's going to commission them for a purpose. And before the commission comes, they respond the way the church is meant to respond. Worship. By saying, you are worthy. And being good, monotheistic Jews, going all the way back to the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me, commandment one. Commandment two, you will make no graven images. You're not going to worship anything besides me. Worshiping anything other than God himself is idolatry. And he doesn't stop them. This is God in human flesh we are talking about. The raised Lord of all. He is worthy to be worshipped. Have we come to worship him today? Or have we come because, well, it's Sunday and it's 10? Why, why, are, why are we here? Let us make sure we're checking that heart inside us to be sure that we're not here simply out of obligation, simply out of duty, but because he is worth it. And he deserves our praise. He deserves our praise. So they worshiped him. But then we have this really weird phrase. But some doubted. Really? After 40 days of hanging out with the resurrected Lord, and we're probably not just talking about the 11 here. Okay, so we know that Jesus, according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. So this is probably a semi-larger gathering of disciples that has come out. It may be a couple of hundred people. It may be a couple of hundred people at this point. And what we know about this crowd that is gathered is that many of them are worshiping, but some have some hesitation. And the sad truth is this, is that no matter how much evidence there is, some hearts remain hardened to the truth. Some hearts simply remain hardened to the truth. And it is, it's tragic, it's terrible, it's sad to be, imagine being there. 
Like, close your eyes and imagine yourself. You're on this mountain. It's broad daylight. Jesus is there having been raised from the dead. He's got the nail prints in his hands and his feet. He's got the scar on his side from where they speared him. And all of these people have gathered around him, and he's been around for 40 days post-resurrection. Open your eyes. Imagine standing next to somebody who says, I don't know, man. I, I, could this be a trick? Are you kidding me? Go up and examine him. Go talk to him. Go see him. And the, when Paul says in 1 Corinthians that he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, we're not talking about, well, he was distant and then there were 500 people who kind of saw him. This is him among them, passing among them, probably teaching and talking with people. There, there's no trick here. There's no distance. It's not sleight of hand. It's not smoke and mirrors. It's none of that. It's Jesus with his people. But there's always going to be some doubted. And it's very easy to get discouraged by that. Because having been somebody who grew up in church, having been somebody who has been a pastor for what is it, 17 years now, something like that? I've seen this. Some just doubt. Maybe they grew up going to church because their parents made them. Maybe they've always gone because it was the thing that you did on Sunday. But there was always this, but uh, whatever. That's just what mom and dad do. And, and when I hit 18, I'm out. Uh, you know, or, or they go to college and they have some aggressive atheistic professor. And this is a, such a sad but common story. Right. I've I've seen those. I've known some of those firsthand who, who walk away. And you're like, but you were with us. You were on our side. What changed? And. The sad thing is that the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 2 tells us what the reality in those situations actually is. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. They were never of us. They were never a part of it. They never had true conversion. It's what John says. They never truly were. And that doesn't mean you give up on them. That doesn't mean you stop praying for them. That doesn't mean that you say, oh, well. It means you pray all the harder. Because that's a hard heart. And that hard heart needs cracking. And the only way that hard heart is going to crack is if God himself cracks it. This is what God says to the people of Israel who've turned their backs on him in the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 11 and in Ezekiel 36, he says, I will take your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. And, and what that signifies or what that indicates is a stony heart, a heart, a heart that's made out of stone. If you've ever picked up a rock and touched it, it doesn't respond because it's stone. But have you ever touched your flesh? Go ahead and somebody touch your arm. Just rub your arm. You pinch yourself, rub your arm, flick yourself. I don't care. You feel that, right? Because it responds. And what Jesus is saying to the people, uh, his people in Ezekiel, is that I will take the unresponsive, dead, hard heart out of you, and I will give you a heart that responds to me. A heart that is with me. And this is what it takes. This is what conversion is. It's when God takes a heart that is stone. And that's the heart that every human being is born with. And he takes it out and he exchanges it for a different heart. God did heart surgery on you if you are a follower of Christ. God did heart surgery on you. He gave you a new heart. 
And that's what it takes. And that's what we pray for, for those who, who walk away, for those who doubt, for those who say, I don't know, man. I, I, know, I, I know there's this evidence, but I don't know. We, we pray for that heart change. We pray for that heart change. Because imagine being there and going, you know what, I doubt. Seeing Christ up and alive and going, I doubt. If they can do that, we should not be surprised that there are many whom we know who, who, who have trouble. Right? And that's why we pray. We pray for, this is what conversion is. Conversion from death to life is a miracle. It's absolutely a miracle. Number two, Jesus begins the Great Commission by describing the extent of his kingdom. Jesus is going to tell us how big his kingdom is. If you were to ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, how big is your kingdom? Because you can go up to a king of a country and say, tell me, what the, tell me how many square miles are in your kingdom. Or tell me how many states are in your or, or sections or regions or whatever in your kingdom. They could describe to you in detail just how big their kingdom is. And Jesus is about to do that. That's how he begins the Great Commission, by describing the extent of his kingdom. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has just described how big his kingdom is. His kingdom, he says, all authority. This means that every scrap of authority that exists is his. Every person who exercises authority, like in a country, all the way from tyrants and presidents and CEOs down to volunteer coordinators, that authority that they exercise is delegated authority from Christ. Those Circles of influence belong to Christ. They are His. He says, all authority is mine. This includes kings, presidents, bosses, CEOs, you name it. If you have any kind of authority, if you exercise any sort of influence, that belongs to Christ. That belongs to Christ. Christ is sovereign over everything and over everyone. And that's how he be describes it. He says, all authority, where? In heaven and on earth. This is an old Hebrew uh, construct, sentence construction called a merism. And the first time we encounter it is in the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created what? The heavens and the earth. It's repeated here. Do you know what the heavens and the earth means? Everything that exists. A merism is this. It's you take these two sort of opposite things, these sort of two opposite ends of a spectrum, and what that means in the construction of the sentence is this thing and this thing and all of the things that are in between. So everything, it's not just heaven as a location and earth as a location, it's all things. Because that's what the sentence means in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created everything. That's what heavens and earth means. God created all things. So when Jesus comes along and says, all authority in heaven and on earth, what is he describing? He's describing the location uh, where the authority is exercised. Everything that exists, every president who's ever sat in the Oval Office has done so by the grant of Christ. This is what the book of Daniel says. God raises up kings and he takes them down. It says that a handful of times in the book of Daniel. Nobody 
occupies any seat of authority of any kind apart from the grant of Christ. That means every politician that you've appreciated, every politician you have not appreciated, God has permitted or even installed in that position for a time for his purposes. Now, we don't always see those purposes because I know everybody in this room at some point has looked at somebody in authority and scratched their head and said, how did that person get there? Right? You may have had a boss and said, how on earth did this person get to this position? We had a boss one time and the, the boss was sort of new in that position, and he had come from another state. And some of my coworkers and I were sort of like, how did this person get to? And I said, well, maybe the last place was happy to bless us with him. Right? And sometimes you scratch your head and you say, I don't know how this person occupies this place and position of authority. But the point and the truth of it is they do because God has said so. That's current president, previous president. And I, and I use those two because they represent one half of the country versus another half of the country, it seems. Right? And they both look at each other, these sides, and kind of go, murr, murr, no, murr. the reality is that neither of them ever would sit in the position they sit in unless God has granted it. Whether you like it or not. But we don't know his purposes always. We don't always, are, are always able to suss that out. But the point that Jesus is making is that he is over all of it. He is over all of it. He will hold, therefore, all of it to account. See, here's the thing. We sometimes get frustrated with how stuff is going because somebody in charge isn't doing things the way we think they should be doing things. Or it's very clear that somebody who is, quote, in charge is doing things they ought not to be doing. And we're like, well, they're the top and nobody's going to hold them accountable. That's not true. There is a day of judgment coming, and everyone, whether they're the highest king or the lowest servant, will stand before Christ and give an account, and will be judged accordingly. That's what the scripture says. Nobody escapes that. Nobody gets a pass out of that. Nobody says, I'm exempt because I had influence. The only reason you had that influence is because Christ allowed you that influence. Get back in line. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There is no subatomic particle of creation that does not obey Christ. He holds it all in his hand. He holds it all in his hand. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, this is sort of interesting because we're talking about the Trinity here. We have to, we have to take a step back here and examine and think about Jesus Christ as a, as a member of the triune God. There's the Father, there's the Son, Christ, and then there's the Holy Spirit. Now, when we talk about the Trinity, we say things like, these are three co-equal, co-eternal persons who are in complete agreement with one another about how the universe ought to run. Yes? Yes, absolutely. So when Jesus says all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, where does that come from? comes from the Father. Now, this is where we need to stop and slow down for a moment. Because the members of the Trinity, I, like we said, are eternally co-equal to one another. However, there are times when a member of the Trinity takes on a temporary function that is subordinate in operation to the other members. This is one of those instances. 
So if you were to go back, for example, and look at the prayer of Jesus in the garden before he's arrested in John chapter 17, there is a lot of language where he talks about, I've been given this from you, Father. You have given these people to me, and I have done with them what you have asked me to do, and, and all of that. This is, the, if we were to describe this with a phrase, we would call it this temporary functional subordination. It's temporary, meaning they're not always subordinate, but they're subordinate only in this Function, temporary subordinate function. So the son is temporarily subordinate to the father in the function of this ruling. The father has handed over to the son a specific task to do. And when that task is complete, that subordination is done. That subordination is done. So Jesus will say things like, the father is handed to me over the kingdom until all of my enemies are put under my feet. Well, until indicates temporary, right? That's what's happening here, and that's how we need to understand this. So John chapter 17, verses 1 through 2 is an example of this. Just a couple of verses here. John chapter 17, and I'll show you one more uh, apart from this, and then we'll move on. John 17 Verses 1 through 2, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life and to whom you have given to him, uh, to those you have given to him. So he sets the parameter of what that function looks like. The authority is to give eternal life. That's what the authority is for. It's the authorization to grant eternal life to those who believe. That's what the temporary functional subordination of Christ looks like there. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 10. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 10. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant." And being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. There's that phrase again. And under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there's, we have this picture of this temporary functional subordination where for a time he empties himself of his authority. He takes upon himself a new human nature. He adds to his God nature. Human nature is born, which is what we're celebrating right around now with the Christmas season, right? He grows up. He teaches he talks about who he is. He goes to the cross. He is obedient to the Father. It says he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He, he follows, obeys the Father's will. Now, it's not like he has a different will than the Father. It's not like he's like, well, that's an interesting idea. Can we talk about that? He doesn't do that. Because... The Son and the Father are in complete agreement with one another, as the Holy Spirit is in complete agreement with them. Right? There's, there's no, can we talk about this? There's none of that. There's none of that. What there is, is harmonious agreement where one takes a position of authority, one takes a position of subordination temporarily, and a task is accomplished. And a task is accomplished. And this is the extent of the, of, of the authority that's granted. It is over all things. 
Jesus is sitting on a throne in heaven right now, reigning supreme over everything. And we sometimes struggle with this because we look at the stuff like the tornadoes, right? We look at the stuff like there's political nonsense going on. We look at the stuff that is like, well, well, how could this be described as the reign of God? Well, it is. And he has his purposes for everything. And all will be, all will give an account. All will give an account. Nobody is exempt from that because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he says. Number three, the result of Christ's authority over all things is that we, his church, are commissioned to announce Christ's reign throughout the world. We are commissioned to announce Christ's reign throughout the world. We are in the position of the king's heralds. That's who we are. We are the people who, now that the reign has been established in the manner in which it has been established, we go out and announce Jesus is Lord. Jesus is king. Jesus is in charge. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Matthew chapter 28, 19 through 20. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So he begins this section, the, the, uh, the response or the result of everything that he said in this, this, this teaching, the all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now comes the result of that. Go, therefore. Go, therefore, and do something. Make disciples of all nations. Now, the nations here refer to two different levels of, of something here, right? It's not just go out and tell individuals about Christ. That is part of it, and that's the first part of it. Gentiles are individual, non-Jewish people. That's what the word nations means. But it also means something else. So yes, the personal one-to-one -one evangelism is in view here, but it's also something else. There is a larger national political thing with entities like nations that are without God, which is why in the Old Testament we find phrases like, I will give you to Israel, to the people of God, I will give the nations to you. Not just the individual lives of Gentiles, but the rulership of the nations. Here's what God is after. Everything. What does God want out of this? He wants it all. Do you know why? He made it. It's His. It belongs to Him to begin with. But it's been an active, open rebellion since Genesis chapter 3. All of the, the world. It started out as a, a family. Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and then there was some murder that happened there and then there was another son Seth and then the family grew and it, and it turned into a bigger family and then the bigger family became separate tribes and then the separate tribes decided you know what well, would be a good idea let's build a tower and God confounded their languages and scattered them across the earth and those then became 
nations. And what God is saying here is that it's time for the nations to come home. It's time for the world to remember who the king is. It's time for you to go and announce. And, and you, here we are, 2,000 or so years later, whole other continent. And we are part of the fulfillment of what Jesus has said here. You are sitting here because somebody somewhere down the line obeyed this command. There were these initial disciples who heard the command of Jesus, those who believed, and they said, all right. And then they began to go out and they began to preach and they began to tell people, Jesus is king, Jesus is Lord. The Caesar guy, he's not Lord, Jesus is Lord. He's in charge. He's the one who rules. He's the one who reigns. And here's how we know. He went to the cross to pay for my sin and for yours, and God raised him up as proof that that was effective. And he has been established as king of all. And somebody then heard that and believed. And that person who believed then began to tell other people about it. And that person then began to tell other people about it. And then so on and so forth, all the way down the line to America, to Mohawk 2021, December, where you and I are sitting in here because somebody obeyed that. I'm here because somebody obeyed that, because God gave me a mom who told me the gospel when I was little, though I don't remember it. But what I do remember is God also gave me an Awana leader named Doug, who when I was eight years old, they, they, they gave a gospel presentation at Awana, and then they said, is there anybody here who wants to give their life to Christ? And I couldn't remember having done that, though I'd grown up in church, though I grew up with a family that talked about Christ. And I said, yeah. And there was a couple of other kids that said, yeah. And so Doug took me into the back stairwell at Berean Bible Church in Wyoming, Michigan, which isn't there anymore. And he walked me through the gospel and he prayed me through the gospel. And I gave my life to Christ that I remember when I was eight years old right there because Doug obeyed this command. Why are you here? Who told you? But the question then becomes, now who will you tell? Because this command is for you too. It's not just for you to benefit from, it's for you to help other people benefit from. This is why we are here, the church. Because Christ wants it all. And, and you can see this from the very beginning. From, from the book of Genesis, you can see. Genesis chapter 12. This is what God is after. Genesis chapter 12. This is what God wants when he calls Abram. Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that what Christ just told the disciples? Go. That's an interesting way to start a command and a conversation. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who blesses you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He's after it. Genesis chapter 17, picking up the story a little bit later. Genesis 17, verses 4 through 8. Behold, my covenant, this is God talking to Abraham again. Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. That's what Abraham means, father of nations. 
I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant." to be God to you and to your offspring after you, and I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. What is he saying? It's going to get bigger. I'm going to spread this, and it's not just going to stay in one little place. It's going to expand. Exodus chapter 19. So, Long time later, Exodus chapter 19, he's rescued Israel now from slavery and bondage in Egypt. And this is what he says to them at the chartering moment of the nation. He says, Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you are to shall to speak to the people of Israel. Now, if Israel was to be a kingdom of priests, who are the priests for? Who is a nation of priests for? For the other nations. What is a priest for? A priest helps to show God to the people and to connect the people to God. It's for the world. Israel was always for the world. The people of God have always been not just for themselves, but for the entire world. And this is where it's headed. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Verse 9. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. This is after the bit about the 144,000. And this is how you know it's actually not just 144,000, that those numbers are symbolic, because he begins to describe it here. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from, ready? Every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Where is this headed? Pe all over the earth. People from every nation, every tribe, every language, standing before the God who is worthy and giving worship. And, and that's how the disciples respond to Jesus. Remember at the beginning of this, when they saw him, they worshiped. And that's where this is going on a grander and larger scale. So, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Then he says this, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There are two things in view here as well. The first thing is the actual practice of baptism. That as a response to what Christ has done and a response in faith, those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ undergo the ritual of baptism. Where they are taken, standing up, put under water, which signifies death according to Romans, and then pulled back up again, which signifies resurrection according to Romans. And this is done in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We respond in obedience to the command of Christ by doing this because it's a picture of a changed life. It's a picture of going from dead to alive, which is exactly what God has done for us who believe. So there's that aspect, of it. there's that element of it. We obey Christ by doing the water baptism thing. But it's also something else. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Not just baptizing them in water, but immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The picture here is flooding the nations with a name and the fame of the triune God. That's the other side of the coin of baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We flood the nations with the name of God. This is what he has been all about, that his name be magnified among the nations, that he receives the glory that because, and, and you know, this isn't just a, you know, some people will look at this and go, man, he's kind of, 
about himself, right? He's stuck on himself. No, listen. We were made by this God. We were created in this God's image and likeness, which means there's something in us that responds to him appropriately in worship because he is greater than we, period, end of discussion. There is no more right thing for the people who have been created in the image and likeness of God to do than to say, huh, you are the worthy one. You are the great one. Your name be magnified. May we all love his name. May we all magnify his name. That's what we do. And so the, we therefore flood the nations with the name and the fame of the triune God. This is who we are. Then he says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. Instruction and obedience are essential aspects of the Christian life. And it's important that these things come after worship. Remember what we said, without the worship, none of the other commands, if we were to try to fulfill the other commands, we couldn't do them well. We couldn't do them right. So now we talk about teaching and obeying. Let's get the cart and the horse in the proper position. First we worship. And then we from there teach and say this is what Christ has commanded. And from there we obey. We teach and obey after we worship. Instruction and obedience are essential to the Christian life. We are made to grow not just have a status change of unsaved to saved. We're made to grow. You're not done yet. I'm not done yet. Do you know how you're not done? Are you breathing? You're not done. That's how you know you're not done. As long as you are alive, you're not finished. He's got something for you to do. He's got something for you to grow in. He's got some change for you. He's not finished with you. He's not finished with me. I'm still in the oven. I'm not done yet. Neither are you. And he concludes with this. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We are never alone. He is always with us. Remember that when it feels like the wheels have come off. Remember that when it feels like everything has crashed and overturned and nothing is going right. Remember that that despite the difficult, that despite the heartache, that despite the, the tragedy, you're not alone. He's with you. And he's with you, not just to say, hey, buddy, it's okay. He's with you because he's given you a command, a set of commands here, and he knows you can't do them. Not by yourself. He's with you because apart from him, apart from him as the source of our power and strength, we can't obey him. Even with the heart change, we can't obey him on our own steam. Therefore, he is with us. Therefore, he is always by my side. He is always by your side. And we can sometimes despair and look at things that aren't going how we think they should and go, oh, I just want to give up. He's with you. He's right there by you. I will never leave you, he says. I am with you always. Wherever we go, we are never alone. We are never apart from Christ. Wherever we go, he promises to be with us, giving us comfort, giving us courage to do his mission. Let us therefore go and do as he says and obey in all that he mandates we do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift, the gift of Christ. Thank you for this gift, which 
not only, he doesn't only save us, but he changes us, he shapes us, and all along the way he walks with us, we're never alone. And thank you that, that he is the one that we look to because we're not in charge, he is. We thank you, God, that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Christ. Therefore, we must go and baptize and disciple the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey and observe everything that you have commanded. And we know that you are with us always, even to the end of the age. Thank you, God, for this truth. These few simple verses to conclude the Gospel of Matthew, Father, are so powerful and so full of you. Help us to trust you, help us to obey you, but above all, chiefly help us to worship you. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.